Hello and welcome to episode 507 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I am one of the co-founders here at ETR and we're coming off of a the B-Kid wins a million fucking dollars kind of week. And I know what you're thinking. I know. Adam, who the fuck is the B-Kid and why should we care? You know, people win a million dollars all the time, every week. There's always interesting people who win a million dollars and you never talk about them on the podcast. And I can answer that. I, I can. I actually grew up in Virginia. I graduated high school with about uh, 450 other kids. I think I was the literally, literally the only one out of my entire graduating class who went to Penn State. Shout out Penn State. And looking back, I don't even know really why I did it. I don't know why I did that. You know, go to Penn State from Virginia like nobody does it. I, I think I just really wanted to be independent, really wanted to do my own thing. I, I honestly don't even know really why I did it. But anyways, I get to Penn State. There's something insane, like 60,000 students there. I know stone zero of them, zero. And at the time, all I did was play basketball. I mean, every day, all the time, all I did was play basketball. So I go to the gym uh, near East Halls where there's pickup games. And Adam Brown, the B-Kid, he was there with three of his friends, including actually a guy who would go on to be named ETR. Not ETR as in Establish the Run. This was literally 19 years before we even started Establish the Run. No, no, no. I'm referring to ETR as in the legend Eric the Red, named for his vibrant red hair. You know, it's so absurd. When we were, we were trying to figure out names for the company, we were struggling pretty hard. And then Taylor threw out Establish the Run. And I liked it. You know, I liked the double entendre. I liked the mocking of the boomers. But then I thought, fuck, man, are we really going to name the company after Eric the Red? And then I realized I love the guy in it and it's perfect. So it all worked out. But anyways, so I, I'm up there by myself in the East Hall's gym trying to get in a pickup game. And Brown and his friends were nice enough to pick me up. We won a few games and the rest is history. You know, we've been gambling together ever since. I'd say that college wasn't really my favorite, if I'm being completely honest. You know, I liked high school a lot more, had a ton more fun in high school. College was just too many meatheads smashing natty ices against their forehead while quote unquote dancing, aka grinding their shriveled cocks against these poor unsuspecting girls' asses. You know, it was just all too much for me, man. But what I did love, what I did love was being in my bathrobe with Brown on Saturday nights, sweating college basketball bets while everyone else was putting on their Johnny Versus shirts and gelling their hair and, you know, quote unquote, pre-gaming and quote unquote, having fun. You know, we're just sitting there ripping the bong and sweating games, which actually reminds me of a funny story. It's Saturday night. Uh, this is probably in like 2002 or something. Saturday night, Penn State, 2002. Everyone else is doing something fun as usual. And me and Brown are just up in his room watching games, you know, eating Chinese food. And out of nowhere, this fucking big ass meathead dude just barges into our room and starts screaming, like trying to fight us. I, I had no idea what was going on. So I slowly put the bong down and I'm like, yo, man, wh what is all this about? And he's screaming and meatheading and trying to kill us. Luckily, we lived with some actual men who came in and threw the dude out. Um, apparently, he thought, you know, we, we threw eggs out our window at his house or something. But I, I think really what happened was Brown yelled at him because he was playing drums and instruments, you know, out front with his friends while we were trying to sweat the games. Just all time legendary story. But anyways, there were other things that I loved about Penn State. I loved waking up mega early on Sunday mornings during NFL season, you know, driving 25 minutes out of our way to a very specific Manhattan bagel, which actually used real egg on their bacon, egg and cheeses. Get ready for the NFL slate. I mean, those were the days, man. Oh, uh, some of you may know that I won uh, ESPN's overall fantasy football title in the year 2000, which is crazy, but uh, won a trip to Disney World. I was 18 years old at the time, which is ironic, actually, because I was at Disney World when Brown won the million on Saturday. And, and I say it's ironic because I actually couldn't manage my team over the final week of the season for a humiliating reason. So I had Brown actually manage my team. So real circle of life stuff there. You know, Brown wins a million while I'm at Disney World. What is that? 22 years later. Crazy. But anyway, I know people win a million bucks all the time in DFS. I never talk about them on this, you know, professional, very sophisticated podcast, but they weren't always my friend for the last 20 plus years. So huge shout out to Brown. I'm going to go over his team in a second here. Um, as for DFS this past week, I was just up to my fucking cock and family stuff on Saturday and I didn't really play. I think it's the first NFL main slate in the last eight years or so that I haven't played, you know? Maybe I'm finally growing up. Uh, unlikely, but, but possible. I actually think I would have lost uh, 
in week 16 because I would not have had Hawkinson in cash, I don't think. And I'm not sure I would have gotten to Justin Jefferson either. For sure would have played Christian McCaffrey and Dalvin Cook. Anyway, I, I do want to take a look at Brown's team, though, the one that won a million. This was in the $555 buy-in on DraftKings with 4,500 entries. One thing we talked about leading up to the slate last week, you know, Dak had not been playing great late, lately, Dak Prescott. But man, he was just straight up so cheap in a dome on a slate with so many shitty weather and shitty quarterback spots. Now, I'm not sure I would have clicked Dak still if I was playing tournaments, but you know, to get a Dak double at these ownership percentages I'm about to talk about is just absurd. Dak had uh, Brown had Dak at six percent, C.D. Lamb nine percent, Michael Gallup five percent. Bring it bring it back with Devontae Smith at six percent. And actually, you know, I went back and looked. We actually had that pretty closely projected. You know, Dak was our fourth best salary adjusted quarterback on the slate. We had him projected for 8%. He comes in at six. CD Lamb, fifth best wide receiver on the slate for us, 13%. We had projected he comes in at nine, a little bit under there. Gallup, we had for 10 points and an 8% projected ownership. We didn't have a great projection on Devonta Smith, but we did have him for 7%, which is roughly where he came in. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that gets Leone really worked up, man. You know, the full 3.9 inches, if you will. Anyway, I, I talked to Brown about how he got to this team. And he said for the stack, you know, he thought Minnesota and the Giants, Eagles, Cowboys were the two best games of the slate. Just too much ownership on Minnesota. Played the Dak side of the Philly-Dallas game because Minshew was a little bit too owned. Key, obviously, to the team, though, was playing TJ Hawkinson in that Minnesota game. He wasn't even that owned TJ Hawkinson at 16%, you know. Easily our best value, our best tight end value on the slate. We had him for 16% owned also, and that's what he came in at. So amazing, amazing. Hawkinson play. Brown said he wanted one of Derrick Henry, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley. Said he liked Saquon best. Shout out Penn State, but had the money here for Derrick Henry. And the other running back spot was a spot we talked about a lot last week, McKinnon versus Pacheco. Um, You know, Brown thought Kansas City was the sharp side of the game against Seattle. Thought the under was the sharp side as well. So it shapes up as a Pacheco game, just going opposite of the field who had flipped recently to being all in on McKinnon. He also played Jahan Dotson on this team against San Francisco, which I'm not sure I would have done, but sometimes you just got to shout out Penn State. What else is there? What else matters? And then Washington defense, Brown said he thought they were the sharp side, but obviously was wrong there as they got trucked. Didn't matter. So really, really nice team from Brown, man. I mean, congrats again. So, 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 so happy for you. All right. We want to get to the listener questions, but first want to remind everyone our holiday sale is over on December 30th. The holiday sale includes rest of season NFL through the Super Bowl for just $74.99 and 33% off of any NBA one week or one month trial. Head to the subscribe page to check it out. All right, enough is enough. I know no one cares about all this. Let's get to everyone's favorite portion of the program, the listener questions. Producer Luke, hit the theme music. Question one from Christopher. He says, do you have a specific plan on when to retire? You always talk about how there are so many things you'd like to do, but don't have time to do them. What's the dollar amount that would make you walk away from the grind to pursue those things? So I actually met with a financial advisor, a financial planner, whatever it's called, uh, not too long ago. Dude says to me, oh, okay. So do you have any idea when you want to retire? And I just snap respond. No hesitation. August of 2036. And a guy says, wow, I've never had anyone respond that fast. You know, normally people hesitate. They make a bunch of conditional statements. They ask questions. What's up with August of 2036? So I tell him that my younger son, Sam, shout out to Sam Levitan, a.k.a. Sam Hinky, named after the goat himself. Uh, that's when Sam Levitan is scheduled to go to college. And this financial planner stiff, you know, he's just laughing. I'm really not sure what's so funny. It's just so obvious to me. You know, right now, as a result of me having the unprotected, the unprotected intercourse, I live in the fucking burbs. I spend my Saturdays at seven-year-old soccer games. I do fine dining at IHOP. I can't do anything anyways. What, what would be the point of retiring? But August of 2036, oh baby, in August of 2036, we are cooking with some serious gas. Like if I'm still doing fantasy football videos for my Honda Pilot and spending hours working on role changes for dust ball tight ends in August of 2036, just someone come kill me, you know, just end it. So yeah, easy plan there. Question two from Mark J. All Day. He says, the rise of digital payment platforms such as Toast, Apple Play, and many others has led us into the golden age of pre-tipping. Given the digital disruption we have witnessed over the past three years, 
have you evolved your pre-tipping GTO strategies? Yeah, so long-time listeners I know uh, are aware. Some newer listeners might not be aware. I am, in fact, the godfather of the pre-tipping movement. When they erect the Mount Rushmore of pre-tipping, I will be on it. You know, I can't wait. And to me, it's just common sense. If I wait until after I get my food or my service or repair or anything, and I'm a one-time customer, well, that post-service tip doesn't really help me. You know, I'm in that spot where I'm in a compulsory tip situation, an expected tip, regardless of how the job went. You know, as an only child and therefore a horribly selfish person, I'm looking to get some benefit from my tip. And that's where the pre-tip comes in. You know, I tip before, I pre-tip before the dude fixes my heater, before the waiter even takes my order. Will I get better service then? Of course. Are they less likely to fuck me, do a half-assed job? Are they less likely to take my pancakes and rub them all over their asshole before serving them to me? Of course. So yeah, the new stuff, the new payment methods, like Toast and Apple Play, it's one small step for man, one giant leap for pre-tippers. And it's a bit uncomfortable right now because you give them your credit card, they run it, then they flip the screen back to you and you say something. You know, they say something like, oh, here's the tip screen if you'd like. I mean, what kind of animal can say no to that? I hope no one wants to say no. But even if they did want to say no, you really can't. But anyway, I, I feel like the adjustment that I've made to answer the question is you got to go even bigger now on your pre-tip because everyone is doing pre-tipping. So to stand out in this new era of pre-tipping, I just nuke the pot. Like none of this half pot, three quarters pot on the river like we used to do back in 2005. I'm talking about just like bombing it, 2X, 3X pot on the river. Really, really, really put our opponents to the test, you know, get the rest of the field out of their tipping comfort zone. Definitely winning strategy in the long term, I think. Question three from Kellen Craig. He says, how much money would it take for you to try a stand-up comedy routine? It's crazy, Kellen. A ton of people have asked me about doing comedy or told me I should go to an open, open mic night or something like that. And, and I appreciate that. You know, obviously I'm trying to do jokes on here and, and have fun. So when people tell me that I should do actual comedy, it means a lot. I, honestly, though, I never thought about comedy when I was growing up, never at all in my 20s or 30s. Recently, I thought that it would be a cool life experience, like uh, as something to try. I do think it's incredibly hard, you know, way, way, way harder than what I do on these solo pods, way harder than what I do on Twitter, you know, just way harder than it seems for a couple of reasons. First, I think part of what's funny about this pod, part of the bit is the juxtaposition of it all. You know, I spend part of the time talking like a massive virgin about range of outcomes and mean median and peer to peer gambling at a really serious and hardcore level. And then the next minute I'm making sex jokes or ridiculous life takes or whatever. And, you know, I, I think the juxtaposition of it is a big part of why it works. But if I show up at a comedy club, I can't do that. You know, I have 100 people sitting there staring at me, waiting for me to make them laugh. You know, I, I can't start with something like, well, we had Saquon Barkley and Austin Eckler projected the same in base. But if you examined our comp tool, you would have noticed that Austin Eckler's 20th percentile outcome was a standard deviation higher. You know, I'd be booed off the stage. Like, to me, the reason the Gender Lab stuff was such a good bit was because everyone was listening. They already knew Fantasy Labs, so all the PPM pumps per minute. POE, pumps over expectation, optimal position stuff. That was that was funny. So I don't know, Kellen, I have to think about it. I, I do have some ideas. You know, I think just doing a whole set, just being really honest with people about kids stuff would do well, I think. Like, let me know what you guys think about this. Like, uh, let's say I get up on stage at a comedy club. I say something like, anyone out there have kids? Uh, yeah. And then you wait for the applause. And you say, anyone out there have boys? Yeah, you wait for the applause again. And I say, yeah, you know, I have boys. I, I have two boys, you know, thankfully. I actually got a scare though with my second kid. My wife and I, we go to the doctor. She's doing the first ultrasound and she says, hey, do you guys want to know the gender? We say, sure. You know, doc starts looking around. She's looking, she's looking. Doctor says, well, I can't say for sure, but I'm around 75% that it's a girl. So my wife, you know, she's thrilled. She's on cloud nine. She's telling her friends and her family, oh, we're having a baby girl. This is so wonderful. I'm so excited. Now, as someone who has a mild to severe gambling problem, I know this, what 75% means. I know that 75% does not mean a sure thing. I mean, one out of four times, the doctor is wrong. I'm probably lost in spots where I'm a 75% favorite tens of thousands of times in my life. So while my wife is going around telling everyone on earth that we're having a girl, I'm telling my friends that there's still hope. You know, it could just be a small dick boy. And it turns out I was right. It is a boy. You know, now that I say that out loud, it's really not that funny. You know, like maybe it's funny when I tell that story at a poker game or at a bar with my boys. But when people go to a comedy club, I mean, that shit has to be really fucking funny. So I don't know, man. I'll, I'll think about it, Kellen. You know, maybe a retirement activity, but I'm just so impressed by actual comedians. It's so much harder than it looks. I was actually living in New York one summer, a really long time ago, probably 2003 or so. Went to the Comedy Cellar, which is a really, really famous comedy club in New York. 
Lisa Lampanelli was an unknown at the time, but she went up there and just killed. I mean, she was so outrageously offensive to every kind of person. I was laughing so hard. And she even called out my buddy. She just looks at him and out of nowhere says, you look like a beefed up Harry Potter. I mean, it was the best. I'll never forget it. And, and that off the cuff stuff, that's like true, true, true talent. There, there's no way I can do that. Question four from Tyler says, an NFL team finally relents and gives us Twitter degen dipshits control of personnel and play calling with oversight from a cocoon coach for the locker room intangibles aspect. Win at all costs directive with two-year deadline. Odds doesn't all implode. Does this venture actually win games or the Super Bowl? So I don't think two years it would be fair to anyone, especially some a group of people who I think should just be making the best decisions like we're trying to do and take the longest view in the room, always. But on a, on a longer term scale, I mean, it's kind of already going on. I mean, I don't think it's crazy at all. There's plenty of sharp people, gamblers who are now invested in teams. I know Harla Bob has his own soccer team. I am a very, very, very small investor in Crawley Town, which is a League Two team in England. The investment group that bought the team is led by Preston Johnson. Uh, I think he's Sports Cheetah on Twitter. People probably know him from gambling. I think he was on ESPN, known from crypto. I, I do think, Tyler, that your point about oversight from a cocoon coach, like an actual NFL coach, I think that's underrated. You can't just have a bunch of spreadsheet virgins. You know, football is such an incredibly emotional and physical game. It's really like a full-blown war. So anyways, I, I think teams are already doing this, though, what you described. Like, Howie Roseman is just running laps around the entire NFL and has been for some time in terms of personnel decisions, draft strategy, salary cap management. And, and he's basically one of us, you know. He never played. He never, you know, he just never got into gambling. He got into actual football. And then under Howie Roseman... Of course, he has a bunch of football bros, you know, even at, at the coach, you know, he had Doug Peterson. I'm not sure if he does this with Sirianni, but I know Doug Peterson had a dude from Yale in his ear telling him what to do on every fourth down, you know, punt or field goal, go for it or whatever. When to call timeouts, uh, when to go for two. So we optimize the roster, the in-game decisions with the Virgins and the Eagles have guys, actual football bros in their dirt, hand in the dirt, actually coaching. We do that too. I mean, I think so. I really do. But let's be honest, gambling is way more fun. Question five from Taylor Smith. He says, hey, Adam, solo pod question. I'm in a state without legal sports betting. I've now been through two bookies where I was up multiple thousands and they either banned me or shut down the book. Is it, worth it, is it worth it to keep bouncing from book to book? Or should I just quit knowing my chances at actually getting paid get smaller the more I win? Any advice? Can't move states, by the way. Just bought a house. Hashtag how rich. So this all goes back to something that I've said on this show you know, multiple times. Winning is a small part of the battle in sports betting. Getting accounts is really the hard part of it. So yeah, for Tyler, obviously it's harder in a non-legal state. But man, some of these street bookies are just so fucking dumb and soft. Like, not that I'm condoning interacting with any of them. It's obviously illegal and there are a ton of issues that I'm sure you're aware of. But if you're talking about straight EV, there's some calculation there. Like if they're letting you bet 500 on NFL player props on some PPH site, and these lines don't move that fast after we bet on legal books, even if you get stiffed, you know, 5% of the time, you might actually be able to overcome that if you're really grinding hard. There's also all the offshores. I, I, like, I think Pinnacle and Chris are reputable. I think, I actually have no idea, but they're for sure still illegal. So yeah, it, it sucks, Taylor. I, I hear you, man. There's just not a lot of good options for winning people betting sports, you know, especially in non-legal states. All right, question six, last question we're going to do today comes from great friend of the show, one of the sharpest people I know, but also Mega Nit. Anthony Amico, he says, does your performance in any one avenue of gambling matter more to you than in the others? Tennis bets, DFS cash, et cetera. Or are you just numb to it all and only care about the bottom line at the end of the day, month, season, year? I, I think some stuff matters more to me. Obviously, my DFS results are very public, which creates some pressure, I think, and that matters to me. I also think that the one-on-one -on -one stuff matters to me more. Small field stuff matters to me more. A one-on-one -on -one tennis bet you know, a one-on-one -on -one fitness prop, a mile race, a head-to-head -head game in DFS, you know, cash poker live. It's more personal. And I think I'm just really competitive. And so in those spots, I really, really don't want to let someone else beat me. I will do anything to win, you know, grind my cock all the way down to nothing to win. But like large field DFS tournaments or even smallish field tournaments, poker tournaments, it just doesn't, doesn't mean that much to me. I consider it just like a whatever, a bonus if I win something, because to me, those are just weighted lottos. Maybe I'm better than the field, but that doesn't mean I'm entitled to win. In fact, I could play forever being better than the field and still not accomplish ever what the B kid accomplished last week. 
there's just so much variance and luck involved. So it just the small field stuff, the cash stuff, the head to head stuff to me uh, means more. That makes sense. All right. Appreciate everyone being here. Good luck on New Year's. If you listen to the last solo pod, which I hope that you did last week, you know that I am embarking on a wild journey on New Year's Eve. You can go back and listen to last week for more about that. If I survive that journey, I'll be back next week for producer Luke, for the legendary Beacon. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.